The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Uh, at the beginning of the lecture, we're going to actually talk about productivity, one of the most important topics in economics. Um, and really one of the most famous applications, or more generally misapplications, of the principles of diminishing marginal product uh, in the history of economics. Uh, many of you may have heard of a guy named Thomas Malthus. He was a famous uh, philosopher uh, who in 1798 uh, posited the theory that we're all in big trouble. Um, and he did so following the basic tenets that I've taught you so far. Malthus pointed out, look, we've got um, th he said, think about production of food. He said, with the production of food, you've got, as with any other production process, he didn't put it in these terms, but basically, he was appealing to what we learned last time. He said, like any other production process, you've got two inputs, labor and capital. But with food, the capital is land. And unlike other kinds of capital, it's fixed even in the long run. That is, we talked about the long run being defined as the period of time over which all inputs are variable. Well, land is never variable. There's a certain amount of land on Earth that's not variable. And at the end of the day, production of food is essentially just short run. There is no long run. At the end of the day, production of food, capital's fixed. It's only labor. Moreover, um, in that situation, labor has diminishing marginal product with a given amount of land. There's only so many. It doesn't matter how many workers you have. There's only so much you can grow on it. Obviously, as you increase workers, you can grow more originally. But eventually, you'll run out of useful use for those workers. Yet the demand for food will not stop growing. So basically, the demand for food is continuing to grow unabated over time as population grows. Demand for food, if you will, is proportional to population. So it's growing over time. Yet the production of food eventually has to slow down because there's a diminishing marginal product of labor without an increase in capital. So basically, what you've got is you've got a forever growing demand, but a gradually slowing production because the marginal product of labor is diminishing with this fixed capital or land, the result is mass starvation. So Malthus predicted that by about where we are now, if not before, the world would be suffering from mass starvation through the basic principles, not because he's a crazy nutcase, but the basic principles we've studied so far, which you've got ever increasing demand, but diminishing marginal product uh, of producing um, food. And in the end, you get mass starvation. OK? Well, as we all know, Malthus was wrong. Um, world population has risen about 800% since he wrote his article at the, end of the, uh, at the end of the 18th century. And yet, we're fatter than ever, right? Our problem is we eat too much, not enough. Now, it's not true around the world. There's starvation elsewhere. But it's clearly, there's clearly no more starvation worldwide than there was at his time, uh, despite the fact that the world population has grown eightfold. So what did Malthus get wrong? What Malthus got wrong is what I haven't taught you yet, which is that aggregate production is not just about K and L, but also about productivity. Okay? It's also about productivity. That the production function really looks like the form of the production function, which we wrote last time as Q equals F of K and L, really more generally can be written as Q equals A times F of K and L, where A is aggregate productivity. Okay, Really, if we think, let's think of this as big Q. If we think about the big Q for society, now let's think of aggregate quantity for society, or else we wouldn't talk about specific firm. But if we think about aggregate, product, aggregate quantity produced in society, it's a function of the aggregate capital and labor in society, but also a function of productivity. Okay, it's also a function of the fact that we use our inputs more effectively over time. So for example, um, one thing Malthus mix, missed is that the acreage of land, it's an empirical fact, the number of acres of land on Earth are fixed. Earth is not growing. Okay? But the arability of that land is not fixed. We get better and better at figuring out how to grow more and more stuff on the same amount of land. Okay, that's the factor A. That's a productivity improvement. Likewise, agricultural technology is improved. We have disease-resistant seeds. We have better land management. 
The bottom line is we are making more do with more, we are making more and more of a given plot of land compared to what Malthus saw in his time. So while K, if it's defined as land, may be fixed, and L, therefore, there's diminishing marginal product of a given production function, the production function itself is improving over time, okay, because of productivity improvements, okay. Productivity, the arability of land, disease resistant seeds, and other things are making that given quantity of land more productive over time. So effectively, in the long run, if A goes up faster than the marginal product of labor diminishes, then pr overall quantity can increase, even though K, the underlying level of land, is fixed. Okay? That's what Malthus mixed, missed, is that the, there's two factors going on over time. The marginal product of labor is falling, it's true, but for a given plot of land, but we're making each plot of land so much more productive, it's overcoming that. And as a result, food production is actually rising per capita. So um, uh, since 1950, world food consumption per capita has gone up 40%. Since 1950, despite the fact the Earth's not gotten any bigger. Um, and, uh, and despite the fact the population's grown a lot over that time. And basically, uh, this huge increase in agricultural productivity has overcome the uh, diminishing marginal product of labor. There's actually a great little box in the Perloff text about a single individual and his contributions to that, an economist, a, a psychologist, I wish, a scientist uh, who um, led what's called the Green Revolution. He basically developed experimental methods, he experimented in Mexico with different methods of improving agricultural productivity and then essentially brought those to uh, Southeast Asia, uh, India, Pakistan, and other places, and they, they estimate saved about a billion lives through the increase in agricultural productivity he made possible with this green revolution uh, in, uh, in Southeast Asia. Uh, really just changed the entire trajectory of that part of the world through the agricultural productivity improvements that he put in place. So it's a very interesting sort of per, per, personal face on this, on this impersonal letter A, uh, how one scientist can really make a difference in that case. This also leads to the larger question, which this course doesn't spend a lot of time on, but which is more of a macro question, which is what determines the overall standard of living in our country? Okay? The standard of living in our country, that is basically for a given level of labor we supply, what determines the level of our utility, of our social welfare, given how much labor we can supply? Well, ultimately, What's going to determine, or another way to think of it is what determines the amount of stuff we can have, okay? What determines the amount of stuff we can have for a given amount of labor effort we put in? Well, that's society's productivity. Society's productivity is, is, the, is how much more we can have for each, uh, for each, for a given, le how much we can have for each given level of labor input, okay? So what determines how much stuff we can have? Well, it's K and A. Given amount of labor input, given a fixed amount of labor input, given how much we work, what determines how much stuff we can have, what's how much capital we have, and how productively we make use of it. Now, productivity in the US has followed a very interesting trend. So productivity, which is how much we produce for a given amount of inputs, has followed an interesting trend. From World War II until about 1973, Productivity grew rapidly in the U.S. Productivity grew at about 2.3 percent per year, 2.4 percent per year, from the end of World War II through 1973. That is, working no harder and having no more machines, we could consume 2.4 percent more stuff every single year. Okay, that's pretty impressive. That means we can just sit around, work no harder than we were, and have no more machines to produce 2.4 percent more per year. Now, of course, over time, we worked harder and had more machines. So overall output in the U.S. economy grew much faster than 2.4 percent a year. Okay, it grew more like 7 to 10 percent a year over that, over that period. Yet, the point is that um, a lot of that we could get for free, essentially, without any harder work or any more capital. However, starting in 1973 until the early 1990s, Productivity fell, growth fell dramatically to 1% per year. That is, literally, we lost a percent and a half per year of stuff we were getting before. We're getting 2.5% a year up to 73, all of a sudden it's down to 1%. That's a percent and a half a year less stuff we can get unless we work harder uh, to make up for it. 
Why did this happen? Well, we don't exactly know, but there's two good candidates. We know the two candidates. We just don't know the right proportions. One is that we had less capital in our society because savings fell. The amount of savings US households do fell dramatically. And the US has a very low savings rate. The US savings rate over this period averaged about 3%. That is, every dollar we earned, we saved about 3% as a society, compared to countries like Japan, where it's more like 20%. Every dollar they earn, they save, like 20, save about 20%. Now, why does that matter? Well, we'll talk about this later in the course. But essentially, the amount we save determines the amount of capital we have in society. Because essentially, where do firms get the money to build machines? They get it by borrowing from households who save. And the less we save, the less money there is that firms can invest in building machines. And we'll talk about that at length later in the semester. But the bottom line is the more we save as a, as a country, the more, pool, the more money we have available, the more firms can take that money and build machines and improve our standard of living. And that saving fell a lot. And that's one reason. OK? Um, and, that's, and the other reason is that productivity sort of fell for reasons we don't quite understand. We know the productivity slowed down. But we don't quite understand why, uh, why that is. But then in the, mid, in the 1990s, productivity shot up again. So productivity went back up towards our historic levels, from 1% back up to over 2% a year. OK? Why is that? Well, the evidence is unclear, but we think it's basically IT revolution. Essentially, we think that sort of the, the slow diffusion of computers, which people were predicting should increase productivity as way back as the 1980s, suddenly in the 1990s it really happened. And this IT revolution led to a big uh, productivity increase. It's not clear if that's dying down now again or if it's going to continue. I'm um, be interested to see what happens over the next 15 years. So we have this period of high productivity growth, um, slowed down from 73 to the mid-90s and then picked up to the early 90s and then picked up again. We're not quite clear if that year is coming to an end or not. But that's sort of where we are in that, in that time path. OK? What's very interesting, so that's what has the productivity. That's all I'll talk about it for this course. It's more of a macro topic. But I will mention an interesting micro spin on that, which is if society is more productive, that's like found money for society. That's like saying, with all our resources, we suddenly get extra money. Society then has to decide what to do with that. The US and Europe have followed very different paths in what to do with that money. In the US, we've taken that money and bought a lot more stuff. We have the highest standard of living in the world. We buy the most stuff per capita of anyone in the world. In Europe, they took a lot of that money and took more leisure with it. Okay? They decided, we're not going to quite have as much stuff, but we're going to have six weeks a year of vacation instead of two weeks a year of vacation. So if we think about, if we go back to our discussion of what determines labor supply is the choice between leisure and consumption. And you think of the wages, the opportunity cost of leisure. Okay? What they've decided in Europe is to choose more along the leisure axis and less along the consumption axis. In the US, we've chosen less among the leisure axis. We work way harder than Europe, but we have more stuff. And the question is, how do we feel about that choice? Has that been a, ultimately a welfare maximizing choice? Now, any economists would say, of course it has been, because it's a choice we made. Of course, it's been welfare maximizing. We talk about revealed preference, and people's choices reveal what they prefer. So our revealed preference, we just prefer stuff more and leisure less than Europe. But in fact, it's not clear that that is each individual's optimal choice. If a given individual says, look, I'd rather have less stuff and more time off, it may be hard to find the job that lets them do that. So while that may be a choice we've made as a society with our social institutions, that may not serve the interests of every individual in society. And that's the kind of trade-off we need to think about. So anyway, that's sort of what I want to say on productivity. Yeah, question. Well, how does higher productivity translate into more income for like, uh, more income for individuals to buy stuff with or to take more leisure? OK, because basically the point is, think of our economy as a pie, OK? That basically the idea is, well, let's think of Let's think of um, you have a startup, OK? And your startup is such that you can make um, this product and you can make a uh, uh, million dollars a year with, uh, with, with uh, 10 workers. You can make a million dollars worth of stuff with 10 workers. So each of your workers takes home $100,000, OK? Now imagine that you discover new technology which lets you with the same amount of workers make $2 million a year. Well, some of that you'll keep. 
okay? But some of it you'll pay your workers more. So suddenly they have more money because you've suddenly managed to make the same amount of stuff. You've managed to make twice as valuable stuff with the same amount of resources. So that's the essential which improves our standard of living. Okay, other questions about that, comments? Okay, so the bottom line, coming back to sort of micro theory we're talking about is we have to think about production functions having a productivity adjustment. Macro it raises these big issues about sort of ultimately what determines our standard of living in this country and how do we want to spend that money. So now, um, with that as background, we're now going to stop talking about production and move on to costs. Okay, costs is, you know, quite frankly, this is perhaps my least favorite thing in the whole course. It's a little bit boring, but you need to understand how cost structure in firm works to understand how firms make the decisions that ultimately get to be a lot more interesting again. So just sort of bear with me. Okay, now, so we talk about costs. Let's start with a couple of definitions. Okay, basically, once again, let's back up. Where are we coming from? I talked about what the firm's decision is the firm has to maximize profits, which is revenues minus costs. Okay, so we have to ask what are costs if we're going to make this profit maximizing decision. Well, costs are going to have a few components. The first component that costs, costs are going to have really two major components. Fixed costs and variable costs. Fixed costs and variable costs. Okay, fixed costs are the costs of inputs that cannot be varied in the short run. Remember I said that the short run is defined as a period over time in which only some inputs can vary. Well, fixed costs are the cost of those inputs that can't vary in the short run. Okay? Variable costs, so that's like capital in the short run. Variable costs are the cost of goods that can vary in the short run. That's like labor. Okay? So, and total costs, total cost is the sum of these two. So total costs equals fixed costs plus variable costs. Okay. Finally, another definition that's important is marginal costs, which is the change in costs with a change in output. So the marginal cost is just like, remember, everything is, um, you know, I think in terms of marginal decision making in this course. So the marginal cost, the change in cost, or the change in, actually, it should be a little Q, uh, the change in a firm's cost with the change in the firm's output, okay, is marginal cost. And then finally, um, average cost is just what it sounds like. Average cost, average cost is just uh, is just C over Q. It's just the average. So there's the marginal average cost is is basically average cost the average over the whole set of goods produced. Marginal cost is the cost of that next unit of production. Okay. So those are our key definitions. Now, with those in mind, let's ask. How do we get costs? And the answer is we get them from the production function. Once we do a production function, we can derive costs. Okay? So if we have some production function, Q equals F of L and K, okay? Then we can say that the cost of producing Q is equal to um, the cost of producing Q. Uh, is equal to F of R of WL plus RK, where W is the wage rate or the rate you pay per unit of labor, and R is the rental rate or the rate you pay per unit of capital. Okay? Now, let me just pause here for a second and talk about cap price and capital. It's easy to think about the cost of an hour of labor, it's the wage you pay for the hour. It's harder to think about the cost of a unit of capital because we buy the machines, right? So how do we think about the cost? I'm going to cover this later in the course. For now, imagine all machines are rented. Okay? Imagine you rent every machine you use. Okay? And think of R as the rental price of that unit of capital. Okay? So with buildings, it makes sense. Firms often rent the buildings they're in. Think of R as the rental price of that unit of building or that unit of machine. We'll come back later to see why that's, a more, why that's a sensible way to think about it. The key point is, the, the reason we have to do this is the wage is a flow measure, right? Every hour I pay you a new wage. If I use the cost of buying the machine, that would be a stock measure. So you couldn't really compare it to wages. So we want to use a flow measure. The flow measure is what we have to pay every period to rent the machine. Yeah? Alternatively, can't we just take the cost of the machine and estimate the amount of time it lasts? 
and then divide it to Sure. No, th th this is, and I'll cover that later. You can think of this as, you can think of the rental. If I bought the machine today and sold it tomorrow, that would be like I rented it. Okay, and this would be the, the cost difference between what I pay for it and what I'd sell, for, sell it for. Okay, but it's just easier to think of it as the rental because it's a flow measure like the wage is a flow measure. Okay? Now, in the short run, okay, capital is fixed. Okay, so in the short run, the fixed costs our fixed costs are R K bar, okay? That's our fixed costs. The rental rate times the fixed amount of capital in the short run. And our variable costs are W times L, which is a function of Q. That is, the more you produce, the more labor you use in the short run, okay? So total costs in the short run Short run total costs are R K bar plus W L of Q. K is not a function of Q because K is fixed in the short run. But the amount of labor used is a function of how much you produce. OK? This implies that the marginal cost, the key concept we want to work with, marginal cost, which is the derivative of total cost with respect to quantity, so DC dq is going to be equal to uh, w, or let's do, let's do it in deltas because we're not doing calculus here. Delta c, delta q is going to be w times delta l over delta q. That's going to be the marginal cost. The marginal cost, so I'm just differentiating the total cost function, is going to be the wage times delta l, delta q. So the marginal cost of producing the next unit is going to be how much labor I have to produce to produce the next unit times the wage I pay per unit of labor. OK? Now, does anyone remember what we called this? This is before, I know this wasn't on the exam la you know, the other, last night, so you may not I would cast your mind back to the lecture on money. Does anyone remember what we call delta L over delta Q? Anyone? Bueller? No, it's the marginal product of labor. Remember from Monday? So this is the wage times the marginal product of labor. So what we say is that the marginal cost is equal to the wage times, uh, times um, the margin, I'm sorry, the wage over. I'm sorry, it's one over. That delta Q does L is the marginal product. The wage over the marginal product of labor. So the marginal cost is the wage over the marginal product of labor. The marginal product of labor is delta Q delta L. So wage over the marginal product of labor is the marginal cost. So think about this intuitively. What we're saying is the cost of the next unit of production is declining with the marginal product of labor. It sort of makes sense. The more productive is a worker, okay, the less expensive is producing the next unit. The less productive is the next worker, the more expensive is producing the next unit. So there's an inverse relationship between the marginal cost and the marginal product, where the wage is the, is, is the constant um, that, that uh, scales that relationship. Okay? So basically, when, the, uh, when, when workers are very, a very high marginal product, then it's going to be cheap to produce the next unit. When workers have a low marginal product, it's going to be expensive to produce the next unit. And that's going to depend on what you actually have to pay, what you actually have to pay the worker. Okay? Questions about that? Okay, so basically the key, the first key thing we want to derive here is that the marginal cost is directly related to the marginal product of labor, and the marginal product of labor we saw last time comes out of the production function. So basically, if you're given a wage and given a production function, you should be able to derive the marginal, the short-run marginal cost. Okay, you might at some day be asked to do that. Okay, now what about the long run? The short run's no fun. What about the long run? Okay. In the long run, firms can choose their mix of labor and capital. Remember in the short run, the capital was fixed, so fixed cost R K bar. The only thing they could change was the amount of labor, and so we could derive their marginal cost. What about in the long run? Well, the long run's a little more interesting because in the long run, firms get to choose their input mix to maximize their production efficiency. So input mix is chosen to maximize production efficiency. maximize production efficiency, which equates to minimizing costs. 
maximizing production efficiency equates to minimizing costs. Okay? So we talked last time about isoquants and the notion that isoquants were combinations of labor and capital that delivered the same output. Just like indifference curves are combinations of pizza and movies that deliver the same utility. Isoquants are combinations of labor and capital that deliver the same output. The key point is that technologically, any choice of labor and capital produces the same Q. So there's nothing that tells you technologically which of those to use. We just know technologically there's a variety, there's a set of choices which deliver the same Q. Well, how do we tell which to use? Well, we want to choose the one which is minimizing costs. So to do that, we're going to have to bring in the cost of those inputs. Just like we said there's a set of pizza and movies, all of which leave you indifferent, how do you decide which pizza and movies to choose? Well, you bring in the relative price of pizza and movies. Here we're going to bring in the relative price of capital and labor to determine which, how we choose between capital and labor. Okay? So to do that, we're going to draw ISO cost lines, which are going to be just like our old budget constraints, ISO cost lines, which represent the cost of different combinations of inputs, just like our old budget constraint represented the cost of different consumption goods. So if you look at figure 9-1, here we're going to have um, ISO cost curves, which are going to represent, and we're going to assume here that the wage is $5 an hour and the rental rate is $10 per unit of capital. Okay? So in other words, the $50 ISO cost line in figure 9-1 shows all combinations of labor and capital that cost $50. So you could spend $50 in production if you had 10 units of labor and, and no units of capital, or five units of capital and no units of labor, or any combination in between. Okay? These are all the combinations of labor and capital that cost $50. Likewise, the $100 ISA cost is all combination of labor and capital that cost $100. Okay? So each of these ISA costs give you the, each of these ISA costs give you the Tr the combination of inputs that cost a certain amount. Just like a budget constraint gave you the combination of pizza and movies on which you spent your income. Okay. Now, the percept you may have said, well, wait a second, the difference with consumers, we knew their income. So we knew what their budget constraint is. Here we don't know what, we don't know whether to choose the $50 to cost, the $100 to cost, the $150. We don't know what the total amount is. That's what makes firms harder. That's why we have an extra step. So hold that thought. We'll come back to that next lecture. Okay. For now, let's just say there's a set of trade-offs that the firm can choose from and a set of isoquants that they have. And what's the slope of this isocost line? Okay, it's the negative of the wage rental ratio. The slope of the isocost is minus W over R. The slope is minus W over R. It's basically the trade-off between uh, labor and capital is going to be determined by the relative prices of those inputs. So slope is going to be minus W over R. Okay? So basically, how many units of capital do you have to give up to get the next unit of labor? Well, what this ISO cost tells you is you have to give up, you have to give up one half a unit of capital to get a unit of labor. Right? So the slope is minus a half. Likewise, you could say you have to give up two units of labor to get one unit of capital. So that's why the slope is minus a half. Okay? That's what it's telling us how much, it's once again, budget constraints are about opportunity costs. How much labor do you have to give up to get another unit of capital? Or how much capital do you have to give up to get another unit of labor? Okay. Now, armed with isoquants, which are like indifference curves, and these isocosts, which are like budget constraints, we can then figure out what is the economically efficient combination of inputs for the firm to use. Okay? The economically efficient combination of inputs for a given level of output. So the economically efficient input combination for a given level of output is going to be determined by the tangency of the isoquant with the isocost, as you see in figure 9-2. Here we're going to use our same isoquant we had before, 
which is we're going to assume that uh, q equals square root of k times l. So same, same production function we had before, which gave a series of isoquants last lecture. OK? So basically, what we see is that the efficient, if you want to produce, uh, if you want to produce um, a given amount, a fixed amount of Q, OK? Then basically, what you're going to do is you're going to say, so this, you're going to look for the tangency of that isoquant with the isocost. And you're going to say that the efficient way to produce that is going to be used two and a half units of capital and five units of labor. Okay? It's going to say, look, given that the relative prices are given to us by this budget constraint, the production technology is given to us by this production function from which we derived isoquants last time. So the optimal combination of inputs to give this level of output is going to be two and a half units of capital and five units of labor. Okay? And that'll produce, you know, basically square root of 12 and a half. Uh, so basically that the quantity, then the quantity will be equal to the square root of five times two and a half, or the square root of 12 and a half units of, uh, of production. Okay? So basically that is going to give us the efficient way to do that. Now, once again, as always, we want to think about things intuitively, graphically, and mathematically. Okay, let's think about for a second the mathematics. Okay, what is this? We know that um, we know that the slope of the isoquant. We talked last time. The slope of the isoquant at any given point. The isoquant slope is the marginal rate of technical substitution, right? We defined that last time. The slope of the isoquant was the marginal rate of technical substitution, okay, which is uh, the marginal product of labor over the marginal product of capital. And what we're saying is we want to set that marginal rate of technical substitution equal to the input cost ratio W over R. Okay? That's what we're saying. The efficient thing to do is to set the marginal rate of technical substitution equal to the price ratio. Okay, that's what happens with slope or equal. Okay, now once again, I find it easier to rewrite this equation. My, once again, to develop the intuition, I find it easier to think of it this way. Rewrite this as the marginal product of labor over the wage equals the marginal product of capital over the rental rate. In other words, what this is telling us is the efficient place is where essentially for every dollar you spent on workers, you're getting the same return as a dollar spent on machines. The marginal product of labor over the wage is sort of the bang for buck of workers. Okay? What are you getting for your next dollar of wage? Okay? The marginal product of capital over R is the bang for the buck of machines. What are you getting for your next dollar of rent? And the efficient point is where these are equal. If they're not equal, then you have too much of one and not enough of the other. Okay? So basically, um, what, what we can do is we can solve in this example we can, in this example, we can say the marginal product of labor, okay, the marginal product of labor is one half k over the square root of k times l. Okay, the marginal product of capital from this production function is one. You know, once again, I'm using this production function k equals square root of k, q equals square root of k times l. The marginal product of capital is one half l over square root of k times l. Okay. So the ratio of the marginal products is simply k over l, k, the marginal rate of technical substitution, given this production function is k over l. That's the marginal rate of technical substitution. So this says that given this production function and these prices, at the optimum, you should set k over l equal to uh, w over r, which equals a half. So what this says is the, given this production function, these price ratios, the optimal thing to do is to use half as much capital as labor. Okay? Half as much capital as labor is the optimal thing to do. And that's what we see in figure 9 too, is the optimal thing to use half as much capital as labor. Okay. Now, in other words, let's say, to not develop the intuition, Imagine you told me, no, I should use as much capital as I should use labor. As much capital as I should use labor. 
Imagine I told you that. Imagine I said, no, in fact, the efficient thing to use is, why not have one machine for every worker? OK, how would you tell me intuitively, tell me intuitively why that's wrong? Why would, be wrong, why would I be wrong to say you should use one machine for every worker? Why would that be wrong, given the prices prevailing in the market? Someone can tell me this. Yeah? Well, the um, renting machines is a lot more expensive than getting more workers. So it would be Twice as expensive to rent a machine as get a worker. It would be more cost effective to have um, the workers sort of share machines rather than get a holding machine. The key point is the machine costs twice as much, but the machine doesn't do twice as much. The machine and the worker do the same thing. The marginal technical substitution is one. You're indifferent between one more machine and one more worker. But the machine costs twice as much as the worker. So you want more workers and fewer machines. right? Given the machines and workers, this is a perfectly substitutable production function. Okay? The marginal rate of sub technical substitution okay, is k over l. Okay, you're perfectly indifferent between these two. Given that, not perfectly substitutable, but at this point, you're indifferent between the two. So given that you're indifferent and the machines cost twice as much, why not buy half as many machines? Yeah? Um, but then if the machines cost twice as much, why buy any machines? Oh, that's a very good point. Because it's not a perfectly substitutable function. My bad. If, if it was, if the production function, great question. Let's say the production function was of the form Q equals K plus L. That's really substitutable production. Then you're right. In that situation, you should only buy workers, right? Because they do exactly the same thing. But that's not the case here. This exhibits diminishing marginal product. So if you only bought workers, eventually each worker would do so much less that you'd be better off getting a machine. It's not perfectly substitutable. I misspoke before. At the margin, you're, they're, 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 they have an equal effect. But as you get more and more laborers, they'll be less and less productive. So eventually, you're going to want to buy a machine. But only once the machines, only, you're only going to want to buy half as many machines as workers. You're never going to want to buy one machine per worker. But you also won't want no machines per workers, because the workers want anything to do then. Here, you'd want no machines per worker. Right? The optimal thing to do, if, 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 this is a, if you have a perfectly substitutable production function, you'd only just buy the cheaper input. But that's not the case if you have diminishing marginal products. Then you're going to use a combination of inputs. But the combination you use will be determined by, by the prices in the market. OK? Other questions about that? OK. So now we can ask, just as we asked in consumer theory, how does a price change in the price of goods affect your consumption decisions? We can ask, how does a change in the price of inputs affect your production decisions? You can see that in the next page, figure 9.3. Imagine that um, wages went up. So imagine now wages, instead of being $5 an hour, are $7.50 an hour. They pass a new minimum wage, and wages go up to $7.50 an hour. What does that do? Well, that shifts, that steepens the ISA cost. Okay? That steepens the ISA cost. You now get, your trade off is now you're going to get fewer workers for every machine you give up, or more machine for every worker you give up. And so at the same isoquant, that's going to shift you to using less labor and more capital. By the same logic as before, you can use less labor and more capital because you're going to see this shift. Uh, you're going to see a shift in relative prices. This figure shows why the minimum wage leads to unemployment. Okay? We talked about it last time. We, we did in a graph. We just had supply and demand and showed you. But actually, this is the underlying mechanics of how minimum wage leads to unemployment. Because the minimum wage, by changes relative input prices, if the only way you could produce things was with labor, okay, there wouldn't be much unemployment for a minimum wage because basically you wouldn't have anything else you could do. You still have to hire the workers. But in fact, that's not the only way to produce things. You can substitute to capital. As a minimum wage goes up, firms will substitute towards capital. And that's why the minimum wage will lead to unemployment. Okay? So this is sort of the underlying mechanics of how that happens. All right, now, armed with that, so basically, when we did consumer theory, we were done here. Okay? We basically said, look, we now know your, your budget constraint, you have a budget constraint, you have indifference curves, you find when they're tangent, you're done. The reason firms are one step harder is you don't have a budget constraint. Okay? Q is not given to you, Q is ultimately decided by you. Right? You, the firm, are going to decide on little Q. 
With our example for consumers, your parents gave you $96. You had no choice. Okay? Well, here, the firm isn't given little q. It's going to decide little q. What that means is we're not done yet. There's one extra step we need to do with firms, which is figure out where little q comes from. Okay? So to do that, we're going to have to then say, well, how does the firm think about the set of choices of little q? And how does it think about how it changes production as little q changes? So to see that, go to figure 9-4-A. This shows the long run expansion path for a firm. This shows how, as it produces different amounts of goods, it will choose different units of inputs. So for the first level of production, it chooses five machines and 10 workers. Then if it wants to double production, it chooses 10 machines and 20 workers. If it wants to double production, if it wants to uh, product, increase production by another 50%, it chooses 15, 15 machines and 30 workers and so on. This is a linear expansion path. This says this firm has a production function and prices are such that basically they always want to use inputs in fixed proportions. So it would be a fixed proportion expansion path. No matter how much you choose to produce, you always want to use twice as much labor as capital. Okay? However, that doesn't have to be the case. Um, basically, um, and basically, I'm sorry, so this long run expansion path is going to be what becomes our underlying cost curve. This is where, this is where underlying cost curves are going to come from and ultimately where supply is going to come from is this long run expansion path. The long run expansion path is going to show us how much more we have to spend to produce different amounts of quantity. Now in this case, what you see here is that you have these fixed proportions that as you increase quantity that the input portions change the same. But that doesn't have to be. For instance, figure 9b, you can imagine a world where as you produce more units, capital becomes less productive. So you want more and more labor, but not that much more capital. So this might be an example of like McDonald's. Okay? If McDonald's wants to produce more burgers, okay, ultimately there's only so many fryolators it can use. Ultimately it needs more people to package up the burgers and sell them. So you might think that capital becomes less and less productive. And as McDonald's expands, as the McDonald's as a given McDonald's franchise expands its sales, it might want to increase the ratio of labor to capital. So this is the case where capital is becoming less productive. And as you see, as you expand production, you're going to more labor and less capital. In other words, the marginal product of labor is still steep, but the marginal product of capital is flattening. So you're moving towards more, um, you want more and more labor, not as much capital. That's one kind of expansion path. Figure 9C shows a different kind of expansion path. Okay. Here's one where labor becomes less productive. So this might be, for example, um, this might be for an example um, uh, something which is a mass production process, like producing automobiles. Okay, where basically as you produce more and more automobiles, you know, there's only you, you just you need you need more and more machines to produce them. You really the people just run the machines, so it's much more efficient to have to do it through more machines and less through more workers uh, in automobile production. So in that case, you could have a steeper expansion path where basically the marginal product of labor is falling relative to the marginal product of capital. So you want to increase the ratio of capital to labor over time. The bottom line is, as firms produce more, they may hold constant or may change the ratio of their inputs. But they'll clearly use more inputs. Okay? They're going to use more inputs, but, ha but the mix of the inputs they'll use will change with their production levels. So the question we have to ask is, well, what's determined their production level? Where does Q come from? Okay? I'll have to leave that as a teaser for next time. Let me just say where Q comes from is Q is going to come from market competition. We're going to get Q. I'm not done. I have one more thing to cover. But we're going to get Q okay, from market competition. Now, there is one other thing I want to cover, though, related to costs, which is an important concept that we have to have in the back of our mind, which is going to come back when we think about competition, which is fixed versus sunk costs. Fixed. My wife always thought I was saying some costs. I'm not I'm saying sunk costs. Fixed versus sunk costs. Fixed versus sunk costs. Sunk costs are costs which are fixed even in the long run. Okay? Fixed costs are costs which are fixed in the short run and variable in the long run, so capital. Okay? Sunk costs are costs which are gone are fixed in the long run. That is, they're foregone once you produce. The minute you produce one unit, 
those sunk costs are gone forever. Okay? And it, they cannot be changed even in the long run. Okay? So, and, and, or in other words, importantly, they cannot be changed by how much you produce. So in the long run, you can change the cost of capital by building bigger or smaller plants, okay, producing more or less. But some costs cannot be changed. So what's the classic example? Well, the classic example, for example, would be medical education, okay, or any professional education. Okay? Once you've gone to med school and done all your grueling years of staying up all night, you've paid those costs. They're now paid for. And it doesn't matter if you see three patients the rest of your life or three million patients the rest of your life. You've already paid those costs. Think of that as the capital of a doctor's office. Now, when you, build, when you take your office as a doctor, if you want to see more patients, in the short run, they might be cramming your office. In the long run, you might build a bigger office. So in the short run, how hard you work is variable. In the long run, how big your office is is variable, how many secretaries you hire, et cetera. But your medical school spending is gone. That's not variable in the long run. That's sunk. Okay? And that's a very important distinction is between um, basically these fixed, fixed costs, what we call fixed costs, which are costs where, like the costs of the office and the machinery the physician uses, which can be changed over a 10-year period, versus sunk costs, which what's paid are gone forever. And the key thing, and the key reason, just to give you a hint about why these will matter, is because when firms set up this, we may see firms in the market losing money. Okay, you may see firms in the market losing money. In fact, at any point in time, we see lots of firms in the market losing money. You might say, why don't they go out of business? The reason they don't go out of business is because they've already paid huge sunk costs. It's not efficient to go out of business. Okay, they've already invested a certain amount. Okay, it's not going to be efficient to go out of business because then they'll give up the cost they've invested. So if you're a doctor and you spend all this money on med school and you're not making money as a doctor in the first couple of years, if you quit and go do something else, you've just given up all the investment you made in med school. Okay? So if there's any prospect that eventually you'll make money, you might want to hang on and keep being a doctor. Okay? So that's the difference between a fixed cost and a sunk cost. So I'm going to come back to that, but it's important to remember that, that distinction when we talk about competition. So let me stop there, and we'll come back on Wednesday, I guess. Have a good three-day weekend. We'll come back on Wednesday, and we'll talk about competition.